I want to try to convince you of today is that all science, in fact, is intuitive. And I decided to give this talk because at Sand Italy, uh, the last morning having breakfast, I was sitting across from another participant in the meeting who's here, Julian, and he said this. He said, I'm not a scientist, I'm an intuitive. And I've heard that a lot in this community after four years of coming to Sand and hanging around and talking to lots of people. There seems to be this big division between a scientific approach and an intuitive approach. And even the meaning is called science and non-duality, as if science is one thing and non-duality is something else. Um, so, just hearing this at breakfast after, at the very end of a sand meeting, made me think, no, this can't be right, because all of science comes from intuition. Everything in science comes from intuition. So think about theory construction. You know, you have a dream, or you go for a walk in the woods, or you take a shower, or you're doing something, and you know, an idea comes into your mind, oh, maybe this is how it works. And it's exactly the same thing for figuring out how to analyze the results. You do an experiment, you get a whole bunch of data, what do you do with it? Well, you've got to have an idea. Where does that idea come from? It comes from intuition. And to even do an experiment, you have to design the experiment. And often that's an extremely complicated process. It takes years and years and years to design an experiment. Well, where do those designs come from? They come from intuition. <laughs> that's the only place they possibly could come from. Um, now, don't take my word for this. Uh, here are some really good books to look at. And the, the one on the left there, Arthur Kessler's book, The Act of Creation, was actually the book that got me started on this when I was a high school student. <laughs> it's a wonderful book. Um, and you'll notice down there in the subtitle, if you can read it, that he talks about science and art. <laughs> and I want to follow up on that a little bit in this talk. But I also want to talk about a little bit what's in that book, The Eureka Factor, which is by Kunios and Beeman. These are the two psychologists that have spent more time than anybody else uh, looking at the creative process in the brain. And this is a lovely book, uh, very new, uh, written for a general audience, that discusses the neuroscience of creativity. It tells you what's going on in your brain when you're being creative. And um, this is a gross oversimplification of what's in that book, but it summarizes it in a sense. When you're having an insight, when you're thinking creatively, a whole bunch of stuff happens in your brain. And in particular, uh, a lot of things get activated strongly, and a lot of things get deactivated very strongly. And if you look in the middle there, I'm not sure what's going to happen here when I do that. Probably not something good, so I... Yeah, right there. The, the part of your brain that detects dissonance, cognitive dissonance, that tells you that you're doing something wrong, that thing gets turned way, way, way down. <laughs> and when you turn the dissonance detector way down, your analogy system can go nuts. <laughs> and you do all this free association and you come up with all sorts of new relationships. It allows this whole part of your brain that I've colored in green there uh, to really get to work. And all of that gets very excited. A lot of that's back here in your motor system that actually is what executes analogies. The other thing that gets turned way down is social emotions. So you, you can't be creative and worry about what people are going to think of you. It doesn't work. And the neuroscience uh, shows this loud and clear. Uh, your whole default system gets turned off. So your attention to yourself gets turned way down when you're creative. And your attention to the outside world is often hyper-amplified when you're being creative. So when you're out there walking in the woods, you're noticing every little thing. And because your attention is noticing all this little stuff, the rest of your brain's distracted. It's not thinking about the problem you're working on. 
So it gets to work really hard because you're not there putting the brakes on. So the, what your brain is doing when you're creative is a little bit counterintuitive, but it's, it's now becoming pretty clear. And you'll notice down there that the reward system is turned both up and down. Being creative feels really good, um, but part of the reward system, the part of the reward system that thinks about the consequences of what you're going to do, uh, especially the consequences of what you're going to do for you, is turned way down. So, uh, in these creative moments, you're basically not thinking about yourself. Uh, it's not about you, this creative discovery process. And that's, I think, a key to understanding science. Uh, science is, a, is an extremely, in a sense, impersonal endeavor, precisely because it is a creative endeavor. Uh, it's, it's an endeavor in which the default system is turned basically off and sort of self-consciousness has to drop away for science to work. So a lot of the neuroscience of, of creativity was driven by um, a lot of anecdotal thinking about the various psychological correlates of creativity. And you know, everyone knows about the aha moment, right? You have a great idea and you say, aha, that's fabulous. And Archimedes leaps out of his bath and runs through the streets of Athens and all that. Um, so it's well known in the culture that create, creativity feels good, feels great, right? And uh, Kunios and Beeman doing their experiments uh, one of the key things that they report is that positive affect is necessary for creativity. If people are depressed, they're not creative. On the other hand, if you look at the literature, and uh, Kessler's book is fabulous for this, but there are many other books about this, there's a large correlation between creativity and bipolar disorder, for example. So you think about people like Van Gogh, right? Crazy as a loon and extremely creative. And he finally was depressed enough to uh, attempt suicide, and he died uh, very young. Uh, many creative people have this, these kinds of bipolar symptoms. There's a lot of argument that many creative people are uh, high-functioning autistics. So there are also these, these very kind of troublesome uh, issues in creativity in the mind. And I think a, a, a place to try to study this is the emotional correlates in particular of creativity. And I, I did some work on this back in the mid-2000s, uh, experimenting on myself, actually, and not using science, but using uh, artwork. <laughs> because artwork was, a, was an easier thing to control. <laughs> It was something that I did all by myself, and I could keep a good watch on what was happening. And what I observed was um, the key question of when are you done? What counts as a solution? You know, you have, a, you have an idea. What makes it a good idea? There's some emotional marker that says, okay, now you're done. Right? This, is, this is actually what you're looking for. And my observation in my own case was that the emotional marker was a mix of very positive emotions, like excitement um, or anticipation, and what you usually consider negative emotions, like fear and anxiety and, and worry. So here are the two sides of this bipolar spectrum in creativity, but what I observed, at least in my own case, was they occurred simultaneously when something seemed done. And I think that may be very significant because if you look at this combination of emotions and you think, when in, the, when in your own experience have you felt this kind of combination of positive and negative, of elation on the one side and anxiety on the other side? 
What's the most common experience that produces that kind of combination of emotions? Well, for a lot of people, it's falling in love. <laughs> right? You, you meet someone and you fall in love and you're incredibly excited. At the same time, you're scared to death. <laughs> so, I think creativity is actually a lot like falling in love. And I'll just give you an idea briefly of what I was doing experimentally at that time. Uh, I was painting, doing some collages and painting big pictures, and, and what I was trying to do was represent ideas. So uh, the upper one of these is called Everything You See Has Already Happened. <laughs> and that's an idea that we heard about, for example, this morning from Joel Premick, uh, talking about the speed of light. Everything we see literally has already happened. When we look out from us, all we see is the past. And that's a really scary idea, right? You're never looking at the present. None of you are in the present. You're all in the past. And I can tell how much in the past by estimating the distance, because the light goes about a foot per nanosecond. Um, the bottom picture is called, There is no process of deciding. And I'm, I at least am convinced that that's true, that there's no such thing as a decision process. And that's a really scary idea, too, because that says when we think we're making a decision, we're doing something else. Um, so these are the, the kinds of things that, that evoke this, this mix of weird emotional mix, in me, at least. Um, I don't know about other people. But at any rate, uh, what we have then is science as a cycle in which uh, we ask a question, we dream something up. It's always from intuition, every single time. We turn it into a question to nature by designing an experiment. And nature always tells us the same answer, more or less forcefully. Nature always says, some revisions necessary. I mean, nature's like the referee who will never go away. They always want you to keep revising and revising and revising and revising. Nature never says, you're done. <laughs> That's good enough. Uh, so what do you have to do? You have to dream up something else. And I just went the wrong way. So science is a cycle, and it's got just one rule. And the one rule is always question and no certainty. You're never allowed to have certainty in science, ever. Uh, Don Hoffman said something about that this morning, and I'll echo it this afternoon, because it's the most important thing about science to know, if it's the only thing you know about science, is that science absolutely forbids certainty. And if a scientist comes along to you and says, I'm certain of X, then either that person is lying, or you can answer nonsense. Of course, you're not certain of X, you're violating your own basic rule. But notice what this means. It means however it feels, however good it feels, it could be wrong. So your gut can be wrong, your heart can be wrong. Uh, you trust those things, yeah, but don't trust them completely because they can be wrong. And as soon as you trust them, they'll come back to bite you because nature always says, no, go back and do it again. You're not quite right. So why is that? Why is science like this? Well, I think it's because science is a, is a deep quest for the counterintuitive. Science all comes out of intuition, but science's goal is to violate intuition. Science wants to find stuff that we don't understand, and it wants to find stuff that we not just don't understand, but confuse the hell out of us that completely violate our expectations, that make our guts churn because they're so worrying and scary and frightening. So that's what science is after. They look, science looks for places where our intuitions is wrong, are wrong. And I think that's just like art, right? And it's always been that way. I mean, Galileo was violating intuitions. Copernicus was violating intuitions. Archimedes was violating intuitions. Certainly, Newton was violating intuitions. But at the turn of the century, going into the 20th century, all of this accelerated enormously. So if you look at the early 20th century, what do you see? 
you see things like E equals mc squared, right? Energy and matter are the same thing. But that's not the most counterintuitive. The most counterintuitive thing there is that c squared is a constant. What does that tell us? That tells us that what we call velocity doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean what we thought it meant. Space and time are interconvertible. <laughs> that's really scary. <laughs> okay? So that's 1905. That's Einstein. And in 1915, Einstein comes up with something even crazier. That's the, the field equation on the bottom. And that delta there, uh, upside down V, that's the dark energy term that we heard about this morning. So this says, we didn't know what we meant by space and time, right? It's this curved, weird thing. And what space and time are doing depends on what we do. So when I move, I just change space time. Not very much because uh, that, that g there is the gravitational constant, and it's really small, but I changed it a little bit. So what happens at the same time? Well, right there next to it is Duchamp's uh, painting Bride. And you can just imagine the impact of that painting in French society, very paternalistic, very conservative. Brides are these pure things that, you know, lead to reproduction, et cetera, et cetera. And here comes Duchamp with his ghastly painting called Bride. And it scares people to death. And it kicks open the door that all of modern and contemporary art has now come through. That door was kicked open in the early 20th century, at the very same time that Einstein was doing this crazy stuff and right before the quantum theory revolution. And you know what happened in art then. It went completely off the rails. So we have this real correlation between two creative endeavors that are usually thought of as different, but I think they're not different at all. So here is, is just a way of summarizing this cycle that's less complicated than the one before. What science really is, is a cycle between intuition and counterintuition. And it's driven by our conversation with nature. We're looking at nature and posing questions to her. And she's looking at us and posing questions to us. And we think of them as, as challenges and, you know, scary, life-threatening things. But they're just questions. She wants to know how we're going to respond. So we do something, and she says, yeah, not quite good enough. <laughs> I'll try you again. And the cycle keeps going around and around and around. And the more we violate our intuitions, the more progress we make. So intuition is great, but the real goal of intuition is to violate intuition. So curiosity liberates us. The, the desire to stay in this crazy cycle of, of ideas and, and violations of those ideas. And certainty, the one thing that science forbids, certainty kills us dead. And I'm happy to be able to quote J.P. Sears, who said much the same thing two nights ago. That's the first time I've ever quoted J.P., I think, in a talk ever. But, but he nailed it on the head. And the curiosity completely frees us from everything. And a curious attitude keeps us utterly open and free. And certainty is its exact opposite. So thank you very much, and we're switching to a panel discussion, so questions will have to wait, and we're done anyway. So thank you. <laughs>